Hi everybody, happy Tuesday. Welcome back for chapter 9, Big Lostman's Bay. I hope you guys made some great predictions for this chapter and you're excited to hear what's going to happen in the end of this book. I'm really excited to see if they're going to find Andrew Belden, if they're going to get to see a Florida Panther since they are going far into the glade, and what other exciting things they'll find along their camping adventure here. Camping is one of Mr. Holzbeck's favorite things to do, and I have camped in the south some, but never actually in Florida, so this should be interesting. I'm excited to hear about it. Also, who doesn't love an airboat ride? So, here we go. Alright. Chapter 9, Big Lost Men's Bay. The airboat roared like a low-flying plane whizzing across the sawgrass. It was such a strange boat, Violet thought, as the wind whipped her ponytail straight out behind her. Mr. Ascola sat perched on a high seat operating the controls just in front of the motor cage. Before they had left that morning, Mr. Ascola helped the Aldens load their gear and explained what they should expect. The airboat is part plane, part boat. He had told them it is designed to skim over the mud and sawgrass. I'll follow airboat route, cut through the sawgrass and down the waterways. On the dock, Henry had studied the map. From the Muskoki village, Irene's father planned to go through the Big Cypress National Preserve, heading southwest to a waterway called Big Lostman's Bay. The Chicky, where they'd set up camp, was not too far from there. Mr. Ascola passed cup-like ear protectors out to everyone then slipped a set over his own ears. What funny earmuffs, many had remarked. Sometimes I give three or four tours a day, Mr. Escola had said. These protect my hearing, so tap my shoulder if you want to ask me a question. Otherwise, I can't hear you. It'll be too loud. So you won't be able to hear each other very well once the motor starts. Violet had sat beside Benny on the hard seat. The boat shot off all at once. Frightening a flock of snowy egrets, Benny laughed with, now with delight. He loved how fast they were going, faster than any ride at the carnival. I wish I had worn my hair in braids, Jesse shouted to Irene, who sat next to her. Irene shook her head. She couldn't hear, but the Muskoki girl had wisely braided her thick black hair. Jesse's single ponytail was being blown all over. Suddenly, Mr. Ascola pointed to the right. Henry, sitting beside Grandfather in the back, saw a huge bull alligator slide into the water out of their way. He and Grandfather exchanged a look. This wasn't going to be an ordinary adventure. Henry knew airboats disturbed wildlife. Mr. Ascola assured them he would drive carefully. Anyway, there weren't tourists on a they weren't tourists on a joyride, they were on a mission to find cat number 27, and they hoped Andrew Belden. After a while, the roar suddenly quit. Mr. Ascola had switched off the engine. The blades of the propeller slowly whirled to a stop. Are we here, Miss Betty? No, I just thought you would needed a break, said Mr. Ascola. The noise and gas fumes can get to you. We're about halfway to Big Lostman's Bay. Big Lostman's Bay, repeated Violet. Is that where you saw the man that looked like Andrew? Mr. Ascola nodded. There are a lot of hammocks, creeks, and coves around there. It would be a good place to hide. Or get lost in, Violet thought. She looked around. The Everglades surrounded them completely. Miles of sharp bladed sawgrass. Dozens of humpy mangrove islands, an enchanted forest of orchids and other blooming flowers. Someone tapped Violet's shoulder. It was Jesse. You ought to take pictures. We'll never see this again. You're right. Violet held up her camera and began snapping photos. The heat began to build. Jesse hadn't noticed how hot or buggy it was until they were sitting still. She swatted the pesky insects in front of her face. Don't the bugs bother you, she asked Irene. Yes, but I'm used to them, said Irene. They are much part of the glades as 
the herons or the alligators. Everybody ready to take off, Mr. Escola called, slipping on his ear protectors. Yes, said Jesse. The roar of the engine deafened her, but at least they were leaving the bugs behind. Henry took out his compass. According to the magnetic needle, they were right on course. He admired Irene's father, who instinctively knew the maze of canals hacked into the sawgrass. After a long while, sawgrass gave way to open water. Inlets and tiny hammocks dotted the river. After reaching a large hammock, Mr. Ascola once again turned off the engine. This is it, he announced. Stepping down from his high seat, I'll help you set up base camp here. Where are we, Benny asked. He felt a little dazed from the long, windy ride. On the map, it's called Rogers Rivers Bay. Chicky, Mr. Ascola replied. It's owned and maintained by the Park Service. I thought we were going to Big Lossman's Bay, said Henry. We are. We're here, said Irene. This area of the Wilderness Waterway is part of Big Lossman's Bay. She helped her father anchor the boat. I have some canoes tied nearby, said Mr. Ascola, so when I leave you, you'll have transportation. You all know how to pull a canoe? Irene gave us an excellent lesson the other day, Grandfather said. He and Henry began handing the supplies and packs to Irene and Mr. Ascola, who were on the land. Henry grunted from the weight of a red backpack. Benny's name tag dangled from the zipper. Benny, what on earth's in your pack? It weighs a ton. Things we might need, Benny replied secretly. Well, it feels like bricks, Henry said. When the airboat was unloaded, Mr. Ascola led the way through the muck and weeds to part of the chicky. Benny saw the wooden structure first. That's where we're going to sleep tonight, he exclaimed. Neat. He loved the high wooden sides with built-in sleeping platforms. It is neat, Jesse agreed. It's like that book we read, the one about the family stranded on the island and how they lived in a big treehouse. This is like a boxcar treehouse, Benny said, scrambling up the side. Mr. Ascola handed up some of the gear. Remember, he cautioned, you are in the back country. Always wear mosquito repellent. Keep your arms and legs covered. Don't forget a hat or your snake bite kits. At night, we'll drape our sleeping bags or hammocks in mosquito netting. I brought plenty, Grandfather told Mr. Ascola, and Jessie packed enough insect spray for ten families. And lunch, she said, unloading a large pack. Mrs. Johnson fixed the sandwiches this morning. Nothing that would spoil in the heat. Sitting cross-legged on the chickie, everyone ate peanut butter sandwiches, potato chips, and ripe mangoes. Irene contributed pumpkin bread to the meal. A thermos of still cold iced tea tasted wonderful. For dinner that night, Jesse and Grandfather had brought prepackaged meals that didn't require heating. They would drink bottled water. When they had safely put the food in an animal proof container, Benny asked, Are we going to explore now? Yes, said Irene. This isn't where Daddy saw the man who looked like Ranger Belden. We'll only sleep here tonight. They all clambered back into the airboat and were soon flying over the open water. As they approached a small hammock, Mr. Ascola turned off the engine. I keep a couple of canoes hidden here, he said, wading through the water. He pulled back some of the branches to reveal a pair of canoes. You can't go everywhere in an airboat. He pulled the canoes forward so the Aldens could reach them. Irene, Grandfather, and Benny took one canoe. Henry, Jesse, and Violet claimed the other. I will leave you now, said Mr. Ascola, once again at the controls of his airboat. I must get back to the village for my tours. When will you come back, asked Grandfather. Probably late today, said Mr. Ascola. You're in good hands. Irene knows as much as I do about the glades. Good luck. I hope you find Andrew Belden. So do we, thought Jesse, watching Mr. Ascola push his airboat back so he could take off without splashing their canoes. When the airboat roar died and all they heard were birds calling, Irene said, Well, let's go. Daddy saw the man on the next hammock. We have a lot of daylight to look for whoever it was. They pulled silently through the wilderness. Henry listened. The plop of a turtle sliding into the water and the flip-flop of a fish jumping, the buzz of the bugs. Even Benny was quiet and joining the 
enjoying the closeness of nature, Henry thought about the elusive Florida panther from the pictures he'd seen of the beautiful cat. Henry understood why Ranger, why the ranger wanted to protect the last remaining animals. But Andrew's love of big cats could have brought him big trouble. Irene pulled and led the boat into a tight cove. Getting out, she tugged the front of the boat up onto the mangrove root. Henry and Jesse slipped over the side and waded through shallow water to secure their canoe next to Irene's. Yuck, said Jesse, I'm all wet. But at least you're cool, Violet said. Look on the bright side. She had never seen such wild beauty. She quickly finished a roll of film and reloaded her camera. But as they walked farther, the scenery became dark and eerie. The foliage was so thick, sunlight was blocked out. Violet couldn't take any more pictures. It's creepy in here, Benny whispered. Jessie couldn't agree more. Instead of drying out in the heat, her jeans stayed wet because it was so humid. Lagging behind from the others, she tried to find a ray of stray sunlight to walk in, and then she heard it, a slithering sound. She hurried to the front of the line where Grandfather and Irene were walking. I heard something, she whispered. What? asked Grandfather. I don't know, said Jessie. It didn't sound like a snake, but then things sounded different in the glades. Irene made a small motion with her hands. It was probably a turtle. It's not a turtle, Jessie insisted. She listened carefully. I can still hear it. Everyone stopped. The soft slithering noise stopped too, at least a beat behind them. Forgetting her fear of snakes, Jessie ran back to the clearing. Here's a footprint, she cried. It's not an animal print. It belongs to a person. It could be one of yours, Irene said. We're all wearing shoes, Benny knelt close to the track. Not like this one. From his red pack, which he had brought along, he lifted out an object. It was the plaster cast footprint. I told you this would come in handy. He set the cast to the muddy print. The prints were identical. Everyone could see the distinct V on mark on the sole. Just then, Violet whirled. She saw a man half hidden behind a mangrove root. There he is, she cried. With Henry in the lead this time, the children ran after the man. They quickly grabbed him. The man did not fight back. Good job, said Grandfather when they caught up to them. It's the bushy-haired man, Violet exclaimed. The one who's been following us. And me too, said a strange voice. Oh, here's our picture of them plaster, getting out their plaster cast of the shoe they made and checking out the footprints. And that is the end of our chapter. Oh man, so things are getting really exciting. This is kind of how boxcar children books go. We get to a point and they start to figure it out and they leave you hanging. So come back for chapter 10 tomorrow. I'm super excited to see who the man was and what that voice was. Chapter 10 is called Benny's Second Wish. So this should be pretty cool. I'm excited to hear, you know, Benny's second wish was to see a panther. So maybe we'll get to hear about them seeing a panther and we'll get to find out who this guy who's been following them is. Lots of cool stuff going to uh, come in our last couple chapters here. Um, one thing I did want to mention, Miss Shaner let me know that she had to cancel today's group. So if you're watching this before group time, there is no group today because Miss Shaner has some really important meetings she has to do on Zoom, so she can't hold the group today. But there will be meetings tomorrow on Wednesday with me, so I'll see you there. I look forward to seeing everyone. Keep working hard. You guys are doing a great job on your work. I'm really proud of everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys.